Tonight, tonight's topic is Botox and filler agents. Uh, it seems to be, in my experience, there's a significant amount of confusion from time to time as to what uh, Botox does and what filler does, and we'll get into that uh, hopefully in some detail. Uh, the proper term nowadays is Botox Cosmetic. Um, when the FDA put Botox on the market for cosmetic purposes, uh, that became the appropriate name. I will probably slip several times this evening and, and use the generic term Botox. Um, Botox Cosmetic is a purified protein complex derived from the bacterium Clostridium botulinum. Uh, when that is found in your canned food, uh, that is a very potentially deadly toxin. Uh, it can cause paralysis of the muscles that allow us to breathe, and obviously uh, one should not consume that can of peaches. Uh, however, uh, when it's harnessed for good, uh, it tends to do some fairly wonderful things to help minimize lines and wrinkles. Um, when it's injected to the muscles of facial expression, it will cause a temporary paralysis lasting approximately three to four months, and that will lessen the appearance of lines and wrinkles caused by those underlying muscles that tend to contract and give us those uh, rather angry or concerned lines. Uh, Botox was uh, one of those serendipitous finds. It was introduced in the early 1980s in the world of ophthalmology. Its original purpose was to treat uh, the ophthalmic twitches that uh, became very disabling for some patients. Uh, and as a lot of our uh, wonderful medical findings have been discovered, uh, penicillin and smallpox and what have you, uh, it was noted that with Botox, it was like, wow, look, the crow's feet look better over there. And uh, since then, uh, it has been used to treat a variety of medical conditions, including wrinkles. Um, uh, Botox was finally approved for cosmetic purposes by the FDA in 2002. Um, its actual uh, approved purpose uh, by the FDA is to treat uh, the temporary treatment of moderate to severe frown lines in the area between the brows in people aging or from the ages of 18 to 65. Uh, here's an example of where the Botox is typically delivered. And this is showing how Botox is blocking the transmission of the neurotransmitter of acetylcholine to the uh, area of the muscle that receives that transmission and causes the muscle to fire and cause the uh, wrinkle. Uh, basically, we get wrinkles because the underlying muscles are moving and causing creases. Uh, the skin becomes less elastic over time, and so repeated motion of those muscles such as repeated frowning, causes lines and wrinkles between the brows. And the, the fancy word for that is the glabellar lines, or a lot of people refer to those as 11s, or I've heard lots of interesting um, descriptions of that. And basically the procerus muscle here in the middle and then the corrugator muscles over here are what are actually causing these lines to form. Uh, the term off-label versus illegal probably needs to be established early this evening because we'll use that uh, description a lot. Um, an illegal drug is one that can't be purchased legally in the United States and isn't sanctioned by the FDA for any use in any area. Uh, when we refer to something as being off-label, it's a drug that is allowed for use in this country by the FDA but is being used for a purpose other than that which was specifically designated by the FDA. For example, uh, one of the drugs that was recently developed by Lilly uh, was found to be very useful for treating fibromyalgia, but it was an antidepressant. So when it first came on the market, it was specifically sold as an antidepressant, but a lot of people in the know uh, from knowing what some of the early research had proven uh, were using this drug to treat fibromyalgia with excellent success, and I think since then it has achieved that. Um, in the term uh, for Botox, um, basically for many years it was used for ocular twitching, uh, but because people realized it did improve the lines around the eyes and between the brows, it was initially uh, used in an off-label fashion until the FDA made it a uh, sanctioned purpose for treating brow wrinkles in 2002. Off-label uses of Botox will be discussed tonight, and I, I 
you know, want to designate that because I think while these are very common, um, these are not the uses that the FDA has officially sanctioned. Um, forehead lines. Uh, a lot of us see the transverse lines going across the forehead, and of course, as we talked before, the proferous and labellar or the little frown lines here in the middle. Uh, and Botox has been very nicely used for all of those purposes. Um, crow feet. Um, again, I think with some of the early research with the ocular twitches, you know, they found that they were injecting areas right around the eye that were twitching and noticed that the crow's feet were better because we have a circular muscle that goes around the eye and when we block some of the function there, those little radial creases that tend to form became minimized. Um, areas around the mouth, again, you have to be very, very careful because obviously the lips and the mouth have very important functions. Uh, but Minor amounts in these areas will a lot of times reduce some of the lines and wrinkles and really improve that area. Uh, platysmal bands. Uh, a lot of times when people grimace, these little line or you know bands of muscle that form uh, can be substantially reduced with Botox. And actually, some of these little necklace lines uh, can sometimes be settled down with Botox to some degree too. Here's a nice example of treating the platysmal bands. I think you can appreciate there's just a lot less tension. And, and this is interesting, too, because in this picture, uh, she is not grimacing. So this is just kind of a, these muscles are visible in this individual without making any faces. And I think you can appreciate how it's softer and just giving the neck a much more youthful look. Um, the um, use of Botox has skyrocketed in the United States. Uh, it's probably the most popular aesthetic procedure performed by a physician office in the United States at this time. Just to give you some sense of what the impact has been, uh, in 2000, uh, there was an estimated 786,000 uh, Botox cosmetic treatments being performed. But keep in mind, it wasn't until 2002 that the FDA actually approved it for cosmetic uses. In 2008, over 5 million such treatments have been recorded in the United States alone. And of course, worldwide, uh, this is incredible. Um, cost and dosing. Uh, cost in our practice is roughly $12 per unit. A uh, typical dose in an area between the brows and a female patient varies between about 20 to 30 units, but certainly can vary pretty wildly depending upon the musculature in the area. Um, some people need very little to get a pretty amazing result, and there are some patients that I find upwards of 40 units in that area, and they still have some movement. Um, men sometimes need more. A lot of times their muscle mass is uh, thicker and stronger, and sometimes their dosage requirements are greater. Um, here's a nice little illustration uh, just of a map of the face. Uh, you know, this is uh, hopefully not too graphic for people, but the uh, frontalis muscle, as you can see, is going in this direction. And so when it contracts, you get the transverse lines, the procerus and the corrugators that we've talked about, the circular muscles around the eye that we talked about where it gives us the radial lines. And again, some of the little radial lines around the lip, kind of a similar situation with the eyes. As this contracts, we get the little puckers or lines there. Uh, what we try to do on our office when we do an injection of Botox is try to map for each individual patient what we use, how much, and where, so that if we have a result that we love, we can certainly repeat it from time to time. Uh, if it's an area that we need improvement, we'll know what we did last time and know how to tweak those results for a more optimal uh, improvement next time. Um, basically, what can you expect when you do Botox? Uh, the discomfort, fortunately, is very minimal and brief. Uh, this is a 32-gauge needle. It's the smallest needle that is currently available in medicine. Um, it is a very brief uh, stick and sting at the site. It's very quick. Uh, most people are amazed at how little discomfort there really is. It is rare to see much in the way of any bruising, and essentially there really is no downtime. Typically, by the time people have left the office and arrived at their destination, uh, evidence of their treatment is pretty well gone. Um, rare side effects. Uh, fortunately, I am pleased to say that these are very uncommon, uh, but obviously you want to make sure that who's injecting this knows what they're doing. Uh, you can get paralysis in unwanted areas. You can cause a droop in the eyelid, and you can sometimes lower the eyebrow. 
Um, again, fortunately, these are temporary effects. They do go away, and again, with a um, you know, seasoned inject injector, this is hopefully very rare to encounter. Uh, some nice examples. Um, this young lady is giving us a deep frown, and as you see, the line here across the bridge of the nose and these lines here. She's attempting to give us the same frown here, but as you see with the Botox on board, the action is attempted, but the result in the lines and wrinkles is just not the same. Again, uh, some transverse forehead crease lines, a uh, little bit of lining around between the brows. And again, not making any faces, but still you can just see how these lines are softer when those muscles aren't under the same tension. A uh, young person here where uh, a little bit of Botox has been placed right here. And you can appreciate a little elevation of the brow. Um, again, it's a little bit faint, but you can see some lines and wrinkles here. And again, she's not attempting to frown in either picture, but you can see those lines are much softer with the Botox on board. Uh, attempting to pucker the lips very forcefully, you can see some lines right here. And you can see with the Botox on board, with the same effort at puckering, you don't get the same intense lines. One of the advantages of this uh, is that if people continue to keep this treatment up, at rest, you can see where this is a very young person, but they also have some lines and wrinkles that are starting to become established. With the Botox on board, again, those have softened. Um, the art of this is, again, not doing too much Botox, because obviously the lip has some functions that need to be maintained, but small amounts placed correctly can do some pretty amazing things. Again, another example, crow's feet. As you remember that circular muscle that we talked about? As you crunch that down, you get the little radial lines everywhere. Again, making the same attempt at the face, uh, you really don't see the lines. That's a little scar that she had previously, uh, but you don't see the crow's feet with the attempt to squint in the picture on the right. Um, standards for Botox. Uh, you know, basically, see qualified, well-trained injectors. There's a lot of folks around the city that have that experience and are well-trained, and I think that's what you want to make sure that you're in good hands. Uh, beware of bootleg Botox. If you're starting to find, quote, deals where Botox is being sold to you less than $5, I would say buyer beware. Uh, that is far less than you can buy a vial of Botox. Uh, the only Botox at this point that is legal and legitimate is that that comes from Allergan. Uh, there are uh, evidence of bootleg Botox that have come from China and other countries that get into the United States. And the concern is, is you don't know really what you're getting, and you also don't necessarily know what the dosage would be. Um, many of the headlines that we've read about Botox that have come out that to be very negative when the research was done weren't Botox at all. Uh, and in fact, uh, in all cases, that have made headlines uh, that doesn't seem to be that it has been Botox. Uh, Botox cosmetic shouldn't freeze your forehead. You should not have to look abnormal. You shouldn't have to deal with an over-elevated uh, eyebrow. It shouldn't unbalance your facial features. And it shouldn't relax your forehead muscles too much. Um, these things sometimes can occur and usually can be corrected by additional treatment. Shifting gears a little bit, um, a lot of patients come in and say, I want Botox, and they're pointing to an area on their cheek that maybe extends from the nose to the corner of the lip. Uh, what they're really asking for at that point is not Botox, but is to help me fill this deep crevice of this line, and that's where a lot of our soft tissue fillers come into play. Uh, Botox Cosmetic will paralyze those muscles of facial expression, so when we frown or squint, uh, it's very useful. Uh, but if we've got an area that may persist, let's say we've got a deep furrow between our brows that's been there for many years, and we've got the Botox on board, and so that muscle isn't moving, but we still have that deep furrow, that's where the filler agents come in. Uh, the fillers are used to fill the deeper lines and wrinkles that either aren't treatable with Botox because we can't put Botox in that part of your face, or those lines that don't go away when the Botox is on board. Uh, there have been 
a boatload of soft tissue fillers in our country, um, and these have all kind of come about in the last several years. They've been primarily approved by the FDA to treat the line that goes between the nose to the lip. Uh, as we've talked about with Botox, there's an awful lot of off-label use of the fillers, and we will speak to that tonight. Um, the first substances in the United States were collagen. Uh, they were bovine or cow-derived collagen and required a skin test. Um, we'd put a skin test on your forearm and wait 30 days to make sure you didn't react and then begin to treat you. Zyderm and Zyplast were two of the early forms of this agent, and they're still available today, but they're not as widely used for multiple reasons. Um, they're wonderful products, but again, we have some products that we think probably are better value and, and work better nowadays. Um, they did have a potential for allergic reactions, and the biggest problem was, you know, for the expense, they had a very short duration. They lasted between one and three months. Cosmoderm and Cosmoplast came along, and they were human-derived collagen forms that didn't require a skin test and lasted about one to three months and largely replaced the Zyderm and the Zyplast. They're still available today, and they are beautiful. They give a nice, soft result uh, and still have some usage, but you'll find that probably are really fairly rarely used because the expense is probably not in keeping with what people are expecting for the longevity of the product. Uh, we spend a lot of time about talking about the off-label uses of fillers. Uh, enhancing lips is technically an off-label use. I think everybody's familiar with that use, uh, but it's certainly one that at this point the FDA has not listed as an approved use. Improving the marionette lines or the howdy duty lines, the little lines that extend from the lip to the chin. We'll show you some of those in some people in a minute. The deeper ridges or wrinkles on the face are filled nicely with the fillers. Uh, the tear troughs, the little area that's kind of a depression under the eye, we'll show you some examples. Enhancing small irregularities in the nose are another uh, nice solution. And then enhancing the cheeks. Uh, you hear a lot about liquid facelift. We'll show you some examples of that tonight. And the line below the lower lip are kind of a transverse crease line on the chin. It's been very nice to fill those in as well. Um, the brow bone, uh, you can give a kind of a, if you will, almost a brow lift. You can kind of enhance the lateral brow. And the back of the hands, uh, a lot of times, you know, the hands tend to give you away. You can kind of get your face looking great, but a lot of times the hands are the telltale sign, uh, and there's ways now to enhance the back of the hands and make that look a little more useful as well. Scar correction is another uh, common use for the fillers, and we'll show you some of that. Uh, risk factors, uh, temporary discomfort, uh, you know, I'm not going to lie, uh, you know, to put these fillers in, there is some temporary ouch as they're being administered. Uh, we try to reduce this as much as possible. We put topical anesthetic creams, and occasionally we can inject local anesthetic to the area being treated. A lot of people are familiar with the term dental block. Basically, what it's referring to is numbing some of the nerves in the area around the mouth, and uh, that is a virtually painless way to inject the lips. Uh, if you've ever had injectable fillers put in your lips without a dental block and then have had a dental block, I'm here to tell you it's a world of difference. Um, bruising, uh, again, that's going to vary all over the place. We all have different responses uh, when we get injected. Um, we can certainly minimize the tendency to bruise by discontinuing medicines that tend to bruise, uh, make us bruise more easily. Uh, notably, aspirin, ibuprofen, vitamin E, fish oil, etc. If we can put those things away a good 10 days prior to the treatment, we will probably see less bruising. Another, uh, if you will, homeopathic treatment that some people have tried is Arnica, and that's A-R-N-I-C-A. -A. Uh, it's a a tablet that can be purchased at the uh, health food stores, and sometimes taking that uh, around the time of treatment can minimize bruising for some of our patients. Um, irregularities, feeling little lumps and bumps or seeing them. Obviously, uh, feeling them is not necessarily a problem. Seeing them certainly is, and again, it has a lot to do with technique, um, and I think, again, going to people that uh, have experience with this will make a big difference uh, in your result. Um, the uh, use of soft tissue fillers has just skyrocketed in the United States. As you see, 
in 2000, uh, basically what we had was collagen. Um, and it was basically cow or human-derived collagen. Uh, and in 2000, about 587,000 treatments were recorded. In 2008, that has dropped considerably, and I think that's due to competition from several others. Um, calcium hydroxyapatite is a, a big mouthful of words, uh, commonly known as a product called RADIS. Uh, and as you see, that has gradually increased over the years. Um, it has recently gotten FDA approval for treatment of the what we call nasolabial folds. Uh, it's a product that is very frequently used uh, in um, treating, um, uh, well, for your um, ah, root canals. Uh, it, it's one of the agents that was used to fill root canals. Hyaluronic acid, more commonly known to most of our patients by uh, the trade names of Restylane and Juvederm, are uh, naturally occurring substances in our body, uh, but when injected into the dermis, attract a lot of water. And as you can see, uh, we didn't have that available in the United States in 2000, and over a million treatments were recorded last year. Polylactic acid uh, is the material that's used in uh, dissolvable sutures that we use in the OR. Uh, it's been approved for facial enhancement uh, when people have had atrophy in the face due to use of the medicines that are used to treat HIV. Uh, and as you can see, that has gradually increased as well. The hyaluronic acid fillers are probably some of the most popular fillers used today. Um, the trade names Juvederm and Restylane, um, and those are very, very popular at this time. Uh, the very first hyaluronic acid fillers on our market were Restylane and Perlane, Captic and Hyloform. Um, Captic and Hyloform have been basically repackaged and are currently being sold under a different name. Uh, very similar to Restylane and Juvederm, but probably a little less cross-linking, a little smaller molecules, and therefore it had a little less uh, duration of treatment. Um, li the lifespan of Captic and Hyloform was approximately three months. Um, Juvederm and Restylane may be as long as one year. Uh, a lot of it depends on the person. A lot of it depends on the part of the face that's injected. Uh, sometimes uh, one area that moves a great deal may seem to not maintain the correction, as long as areas that are um, not as mobile. Um, the differences uh, primarily in the hyaluronic acid fillers at this point are whether they're animal or non-animal based. Um, the animal based came from chicken. The non-animal base actually came from the streptococcal bacteria. And right now, the uh, Juvederm and Restylane are the non-animal based products. Um, there are many other hyaluronic acid fillers currently available in the United States. Prevail Silk is, um, I believe, what Hyaluform used to be. Uh, Elevest, Restylane, Perlane, which are both sold by Metasys. Juvederm Ultra, Juvederm Ultra Plus, uh, and again, the advantages of hyaluronic acid fillers are many. They give you a very nice correction of the deeper lines and wrinkles. They're very well tolerated. I've yet to see an allergic reaction, and those are uh, very unusually reported. Uh, they're basically um, erasable, if you will. There's an application of white ace, which is a hyaluronidase or basically an enzyme that breaks down hyaluronic acid. And so if you have an area that uh, is not to your liking, it can be dissolved with the white ace, which is kind of a nice feature. Um, some nice examples of what the Juvederm and Restylane and the various hyaluronic acids can do. A young patient, very youthful, but you can see fairly deep nasolabial folds. Here she is uh, with the nasolabial folds markedly decreased with an application of one of the hyaluronic acids. Same patient, just a little different view, but I can see, you know, just very nice, subtle change, uh, very easy correction to make. Um, again, I think you can see uh, changes in the nasolabial folds and lips. Um, and again, a lot of times when you enhance the border of the lip, a lot of these little tiny lipstick bleed lines, when you put your lipstick on it, kind of feathers out, are diminished. Um, 
example here, uh, same patient, but, you know, again, you can just see nice correction of the nasolabial folds and increasing the, the fullness of the lip. Um, tear troughs, again, as you can see, this gentleman has some deepening of these areas below the eyes. And what happens a lot of times as we get a little older, um, that orbital bone, we have a, you know, in our bone, we have a circle here around our orbit or around our eye. And as those tissues become a little thinner, we get kind of a depression there. And just by plumping that up a little bit, I think you can see a nice improvement in the uh, fullness. Um, marionette lines are these lines down in this direction, and I think these are subtle, but I think you can see an improvement. And again, an improvement in some of the lip lines here. Another example of tear troughs. I think this is a really nice example. You can see this girl doesn't need a blepharoplasty. She doesn't have bags, per se, but she's just got kind of a hollow right here. And I think you can see a nice correction with the uh, Juvederm in that area. Another example, again, just kind of tends to give us sort of a tired look. And you can see how it's just filled in a little bit. Again, just it doesn't always get rid of the color. A lot of times we have some discoloration there that doesn't go away because that's pigment in our skin. But I think you can see how it approves the contour. Um, this is a subtle finding. I think it's probably easier seen in person, but I think you can see a hollowing there. And it's a little bit more filled in. And I think it's a little more evident in the black and white photo here. Um, Evalence is one of the newer fillers uh, that became available to us through Johnson & Johnson. Um, it's a pig or porcine-derived collagen, which uh, was originally developed in Israel. It is a kosher product. Um, it was approved by the FDA in August of this year. Uh, no skin testing is required because they've cleaved the antigenic part of that molecule off. So, you know, that's kind of a nice little feature of a collagen substance. The manufacturer uh, claims it lasts up to six months, and I can tell you from my own personal experience, uh, it's probably almost nine months in my own personal experience, and I know that there's some evidence in some of the patients that have been treated up to 18 months. However, the company is not going to be able to say that until the FDA uh, approves them to uh, say those kind of claims. Um, less bruising. For whatever reason, as this material is injected, there is a little bit of a coagulation effect, and so there does seem to be a little less bruising at the injection site. In the nasal labial folds, again, guys, I'm sorry, we've got kind of an uncooperative mouse here, but I think you can see it's very similar to the effects of the Juvederm and Restylane. Um, again, lines around the nose and mouth markedly decreased. Again, nice example in the nasal labial folds. And another example, nasal labial folds, and then these marionette lines down in here are softened significantly. Artifil is another substance that uh, was introduced to the United States. It's a bovine or uh, cow-based collagen with what they call polymethyl methacrylate beads. Um, it, because of the cow collagen, it did require skin testing and a 30-day waiting period. Um, European evidence with this, it was sold in Europe under the name Arta Coal, uh, that it lasts up to 20 years or longer. Uh, the United States evidence indicated that it lasts up to five years, and I, I believe that probably we'd see something very similar to the European evidence. We just don't have the amount of longevity with the product. Uh, it was approved by the FDA for treatment of the nasal labial folds. And unfortunately, the manufacturer filed bankruptcy. I think this was one of those situations where the manufacturer had um, a wonderful product, but it was the only product they had. And I think that the timing was just not great with the economy as it has been. I think they were pretty hurt by this. I have a feeling that somebody will pick up this patent and probably have this back on the United States market soon. It, it's been a great um, agent for us, and I think our patients have been very happy with it. Some examples, again, uh, softening of the nasal labial folds, um, it's just tremendous. And, you know, these results do seem to last in the two plus, almost three years that we've been working with this. 
uh, again, you know, nice softening. Very natural result. Um, people are always asking, you know, is it something that as my face ages, is this going to leave a line or a crease or something? And it doesn't. It's it's really just kind of part of your tissue, so it's not like you're putting in a a, a block of something. We mentioned earlier, Radius is a calcium hydroxyapatite pro product. Um, it's again used for nasolabial fold for its labeled or its FDA approved use. Um, if it's been used in lips, sometimes cyst formation occurs. So I have pretty much stuck to keeping it in the uh, dermis or the deeper part of the uh, face along the folds and lines, but probably avoided the lips. Uh, a really cool thing to do with this has been what we call hand rejuvenation. As you can see, the tendons, the vessels, a lot of times are a little bit more obvious on the back of the hands, giving the hands a more aged appearance. And I think you could appreciate uh, right and left hand on this individual um, how that looks just a little more youthful. Uh, Sculptra has been used for uh, treatment of the retroviral uh, atrophy of the soft tissues of the face. A lot of times when people are in treatment for uh, some of the medicines that are required for HIV, they uh, lose a lot of fat in their face and look aged and gaunt. Um, and it's also been used in an off-label approach for enhancing the face as well. Uh, they claim uh, probably lasting upwards of a year. Um, liquid facelift is a term that's kind of been coined here recently, and I think it, it certainly is a, a nice way to use fillers and Botox and conjunction to try to lift and contour facial features without surgery, and it's become very popular in our practice. It just very gently and subtly lifts the features, restores the natural contours, it helps to reduce the wrinkles, creases, and folds, and uh, obviously won't give the same results as surgery, but I'll show you a few examples here to see how it does give a more healthy, fuller appearance. Um, Botox added to this um, helps to give a little more endurance and lift to the fillers. As I said before, if you've got a, a line between the brow and you just keep squeezing down on those lines with filler in it, you're going to wear the filler out. But if you've got both tucks that keeps you from squeezing down, that filler is going to last a lot longer. Um, it's not for everybody. If you're expecting a facelift result, it's not going to give you that. So I think it's something that has to be very judiciously used. Uh, I think this is an excellent example. I think you can see right Hollowness to the cheek. Um, she's a little flat over here. Um, very healthy, active individual, but I think you can see in the picture on the right, she just looks healthier. You know, got a little bit more roundness to the contour of the cheek. Doesn't look as gaunt here. Um, another example, um, and these, we have a, a camera that basically aligns things to make sure that they're taken at the same angle. On this side, you can see the nose is just slightly outside the line of the cheek. With the same angle, you can see how the cheek has been filled out where she's not as flat here. Uh, again, kind of a flat, what we call malar or cheek area. And you can see how the area below the eye looks deeper and how here it's been nicely filled in. Just gives a little bit more of a youthful, rested look. Again, a very young person. You look at the picture on the left and say, well, what does she need? Well, obviously not a lot. But, you know, you can see how the tension has gone out of the forehead. Um, a little subtle effect, there's been a little bit of material injected here to give the brows a bit of a lifted appearance. Um, you can see the cheeks are a little less hollow under the eyes. Um, and the nasal labial folds have been softened uh, with just fillers and Botox. Another young person, uh, but again, just a little bit of hollowing under the eyes a little flatness in the cheek, and you can see here how the area under the eye has been filled out, and the side of the cheek has been elevated a little bit. A um, little bit of elevation here to the lateral brow, too. Um, and I think a nice combination of what the fillers and the Botox can do. Again, it's very subtle, but when you look from one picture to the next, it just looks like she's been on a nice vacation or something when you look at the picture on the right. Same person, but just frontal view, and I think you can see it just tends to look a little healthier and, and more rested. Um, a little bit of a depression here, and this a lot of people have kind of a cleft uh, right there under their eyes, kind of where their cheek is a little hollow, and that's been nicely filled out and gives a very nice, natural look. Kind of same effect here. I think you can appreciate a little fullness in the brow, 
a little less tension in the forehead between the brows. Nasal labial folds have been improved. And again, just right here, looks a little less hollow, just kind of filled out. See how, you know, she's a little flat right here and how the um, nice natural curve to the cheek has been restored. Again, just simple use of some fillers and some Botox. Um, on that note, uh, you know, kind of know when to say when, and friends don't let friends do this. Um, basically, uh, famous people in the news, um, I think a little is good, a lot maybe not so much. Um, you know, again, uh, you don't have to be frozen. You don't have to have this evil Cruella de Vil look going on or, you know, nothing going on in some cases. Um, so I think, you know, again, it's probably something that, uh, as I said, a little is good, a lot, sometimes not so much. Uh, at this point, I'd like to open it up for questions. And if anybody would like to uh, email me their questions, uh, that would be great. Uh, I have one question here uh, about the cost. Um, the cost of fillers uh, in our office is $450 a syringe for Evelyn's, Juvederm, Radius, uh, Restylane, Perlane, all of them. The only thing is a little more expensive than that is Artifil. Artifil is $600 for uh, 0.4 cc's and $1,200 for 0.8 cc's. A uh, question I get asked a lot of times, too, is does it cost more to um, numb the area? Uh, the answer is no. We do uh, the numbing topically or dental blocks, um, however we need to do to um, make the treatment as comfortable as possible. Somebody else asked, was, um, are the uh, liquid face lifts or liquid fillers, does it take time to, quote, set up? And the answer is no, it really does not. If you uh, inject the area, it's pretty much an instantaneous response. Um, so there's really not a, a real significant, if you will, setup time. Um, the question somebody else asked was if there's any special prices on fillers. And, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, we do have a filler event coming up on May 7th. Um, all of the fillers, with the exception of Artifil, are $375 a syringe, plus there's a $100 gift certificate to Phases, which is the aesthetic side of our practice for every syringe purchase. There's a limited number of appointments um, that are still available, so obviously if you have an interest in this, uh, give us a shout. Uh, but this is uh, something that uh, we're looking forward to doing. Um, Fillers don't move. That was another question somebody asked. They don't tend to move or indent. Um, the other question that somebody else asked, and we didn't mention fat. I think you could spend a whole night uh, talking about fat in terms of a filler. And, you know, obviously we do do some fat transfers, but kind of confined our talk tonight to the uh, various um, commercially purchased facial fillers. Uh, questions also come up about financing. Uh, you know, Care Credit uh, offers the 90 days same as cash and now um, six months uh, same as cash for all the Allergan products. Uh, that's kind of an interesting new twist and I think that's been something that we've actually um, made, been made aware of in the last um, um, probably week. I think that's kind of new news. Um, the um, Consultation for fillers, if somebody comes to us and are wanting to do the fillers in the same setting, as long as we know that and are prepared for that, uh, we can perform the treatment at the same time. Uh, but oftentimes uh, people will uh, want to just come in and talk about it and decide later, and we certainly can do that both ways. Uh, age range kind of is all over the place. It's not necessarily something that you have to be older uh, to do. As you see, a lot of young people are enhancing the area around the mouth and lips, um, so it's not necessarily age related. Uh, and I think uh, as far as the skin testing at this point, really the only product that we have to skin test for at this point in our um, materials is the uh, Artifil. 
If there are no other questions, I'll go ahead and close tonight. Thank you very much for attending. If you have any other questions, feel free to email me at drturkle at turklemd.com. And uh, as mentioned before, this will be archived on our website, turklemd.com, uh, and we will be notifying you when that is available. So thanks once again for